we could um, talk tonight about just that sense of insecurity. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be a, an overt, in your face, 24 hour a day insecurity, but just maybe it's just a sort of a nagging background level insecurity that most of the time we're not that aware of. Um, you know, we, there's, you know, we're busy throughout the day and then maybe only in moments when we're tired or bored or we wake up in the middle of the night that, um, you know, we sense that. Maybe it's just that far in the background that it's not always present. And it could be much more. I mean, it could be, um, you know, a, uh, um, really present anxiety. There can be outright fear, um, you know, depending on the level. It can be related to a particular circumstance or just we don't know why. It's just sort of in the background there somewhere that um, there's not a story that really goes with it, and yet it seems to be there. So I thought it would be useful since uh, I'm guessing that this applies to many of us uh, to really explore that, to see if there is a um, common root to that, that, um, that we can work with that makes some, uh, where we can make some sense out of it. Um, so I think the first thing is to recognize that this sense of um, anxiety or um, restlessness or insecurity has a, a valid evolutionary um, uh, source for it. Uh, and that is, you know, when our ancestors were back on the savanna and um, we weren't the most powerful animal on earth, um, I mean, there there was a legitimate reason to feel insecure. I mean, there were um, uh, dangerous creatures out there. I mean, some of them had zero legs, some of them had two legs, some of them had four legs. But um, they, there were any number of creatures that um, could threaten our very existence. So having having this uh, heightened sense of awareness. Um, you know, always on the lookout, you know, the sense of vulnerability, um, you know, being present for possible danger, you know, always looking for a sign, um, had a very real benefit both to the individual and to uh, the species as, as humans in those days. Um, nowadays, you know, there's not much threat from zero leg creatures or four leg creatures, you know, unless you're in the business of being a snake charmer. But, um, and even, even two legged creatures, uh, in terms of physical threat to our survival, um, uh, gen generally not, um, you know, there, there are major exceptions to that, you know, if, you know, one happens to be in wartime or protesting against the government or having, you know, a darker skin tone. Um, you know, it, it is wise to uh, maintain a heightened sense of vigilance, um, you know, on the lookout for uh, danger, physical danger. But for most of us, um, there, the, 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 the threat is psychological, not physical, right? It's a threat to our sense of ourself rather than to the physicality of ourself. Um, and we can, you know, we'll just start the sort of most obvious level and, and work our way down. Um, but let's, let's just say, um, you know, we overhear um, a friend's you know, someone who we thought was a good friend saying something mean about us or derogatory about us, right? It happens. Okay, just just that event can 
often send us into a tailspin, right, about, you know, just, you know, why that shouldn't happen, that wasn't fair, that wasn't true, that wasn't right, why me? No, we can go into that storyline, you know, we can, um, that, those thoughts can precipitate emotions, you know, sadness, depression, anger, resentment, etc. cetera. Um, so we can uh, see that really, I think we can see it as really a two-step process, right? There's the event. Somebody says something about us. Well, there's like 8 billion other people, you know, there will be things happen as we go about our day-to-day -day affairs in the world um, where something happens that is um, not to our liking, right? So we, we have, hopefully we can see we have really no control over that, how that all unfolds. Sometimes it'll you know, be in our favor, sometimes not. Um, and it's just how life works. Life gives us that whole spectrum of experiences. So, you know, that first step, the event itself, no control, right? So the second step is how we choose to respond to that, right? And um, and there's there's really two parts to that too. Um, the, the the one is uh, we don't really have any control about what our our mind what may run through our mind in reaction to that coming up with the storylines, the objections, the um, you know the deciding. Um, you know, the, the words to replay in our head to sort of make sense of it or justify our own behavior, etc. cetera. Um, that happens just totally out of conditioning, that, that conditioned reactive self, that mental uh, reaction, okay? That also we don't have any control over. What we do have, the second part of the second part, what we do have control over is um, whether we believe that storyline that's running through our head in that moment. That's what we do have control. We can choose to believe it and get consumed by it or not. You know, so if we, if we just see it as a conditioned mental reaction um, and can watch that, there's an opportunity to actually learn something from it, you know, learn uh, about the degree of which our um, reactive nature is um, quite mechanical. It's um, difficult yet really valuable to see that, just the extent of it. You know, we can't see it if we're trying to justify ourselves. We can see it if we just allow it to be, allow that mental um, whirlpool in our head to, um, to express itself. We don't have to act on it, but we can watch it, watch what it says to itself. That we can learn from, but we can only learn from it when we allow it to just, just unwind, just be present for it without judgment. That's really the key. So this is, this is a quite obvious sort of first layer, you know, our um, sort of hypersensitivity uh, that may be appropriate in certain cultural conditions, certain countries in the world, but for most of us, um, being hypersensitive to everything that somebody says about us or what we imagine that they say, might think about us or say about us, um, is just creating an unnecessary storyline um, and, you know, eating away at our life energy just by being engaged in that level of drama and unnecessary, right? Okay, so going a bit deeper, um, you know, the other ways that we can identify uh, our, with ourselves has to do with, um, you know, our careers, our relationships, um, our appearance, um, our social standing, um, our wealth, our health, um, these kind of attributes that 
we've all been taught sort of will lead to a level of happiness in this lifetime. And um, so if we've managed to put some of those pieces in place over a course of a lifetime, um, there's still an uneasiness about that, even though we've sort of gone down that road with a relative degree of success, um, there's still an uneasiness there because we know that all of those things are subject to loss, all of them. Um, so even if it doesn't feel like they're that vulnerable in the moment, there is the underlying understanding that, um, that they're not forever, right? And at some point, um, those ways that we identify ourselves will, um, will be lost one way or the other. So even, even when things are going well in that arena, right, in life's arena, um, there still can be that underlying sense of insecurity because um, all of those situations uh, that we've established in life, friendships, relationships, careers, um, social positions, you know, what other people think of us, all of that is subject to change. You know, we don't, we don't know for certain how that's all going to play out. Um, and then if we go a little bit deeper, we can see that there's also a layer of beliefs, you know, beliefs about who I am, right? You know, what I hold dear, what my principles are, what my morals are, you know, what my storyline up to this point has been, you know, what I'm good at, what I'm not good at, all of this package about um, beliefs about what I am. So the, the difficulty in sort of maintaining that fortress of beliefs, right? This is who I am, I, I, I know it, <laughs> is that it also subject to change, right? If we think back, you know, 10, 20 or more years ago, um, ideas that we have about ourselves, about the world, uh, a lot of them didn't survive, even though we may have believed them with great certainty back then. You know, ideas about our, ourself, who we are, what we could do, what we couldn't do. Um, and that, those ideas change over time. So, you know, even though we try to maintain this sort of set of beliefs that, you know, we can rely on, we know what we are, we believe these things, um, um, those beliefs are vulnerable. They're vulnerable to, the, uh, to life, you know, life threatening those beliefs by providing evidence to the contrary. You know, for example, if um, you've ever been in a relationship that eventually um, went downhill, um, leading eventually to separation, uh, there were many times along there that the belief in the relationship was being challenged and, you know, we were sort of doggedly hanging on to it um, by telling us whatever we were telling ourselves, yes, but it's worth it. Yes, there's flaws. Yes, it's difficult, but I know it'll work out, you know. So we, we can maintain our beliefs at um, the expense of what life is actually telling us. So in some very real way, we trust our beliefs more than our direct experience of life. Our beliefs are more valuable to hang on to than the lessons that are, we're, we're getting really every moment from life. So, um, and then there's this matter of uh, a particular belief, this belief in me as a separate self, me as the doer of my deeds, the thinker of my thoughts, that, that one, that one that we call I. So we have 
a really strong belief in the existence of that internal entity, even though we can't quite put our finger on it, but we know it's, it's there somewhere and operating somehow, and it is the one that is choosing to act or not act, think this rather than that. It's the one having these feelings. That, that idea of a entity, you know, so we can see, I mean, if we look at our, let's say we look at our foot, we can say, well, no, I don't think it's down there. But, you know, we sort of imagine, well, it's probably up here somewhere. Up in my head is probably where it's located. It's where it seems to be located. I mean, that happens to be where my eyes are looking out of. So that might influence our assessment about where that actually resides. But there is this sense of a separate self, even though when we go looking for it, uh, it is notoriously hard to find. So all of the things that we do in defense of that separate self um, is, really, is really to confirm its existence to itself, right? There, it knows, somewhere it knows that it is impersonating a separate individual, you know? And so it sort of wants to accumulate, you know, some history, some credentials, some skills, some attributes um, that it can pump itself up with. But it, deep down, I think there's this sense of yes, but what is it exactly? What? What can I pump myself up with that will be so permanent that I can sort of rest, that I've attained a sufficient accolade that I, I'm, I'm good, you know, I'm good for the rest of my life, I've done it, I can relax. That doesn't seem to happen. We, we always seem to need the next thing and the next thing. I mean, we can see that obviously in, um, I don't know, movie stars, you know, you know, famous musicians, um, only ever as good as the last film, right? And then the anxiety comes in, what about the next one? You know, will my fans still like me? You know, can I do better? You know, there's this sense of nothing is sufficient to permanently, um, define this as a separate self. You know, where it can finally rest on its laurels. I've done it, nothing more to prove to myself or others. Right? But there's, there's a sense of I am faking it. Anybody ever feel that? Like, anybody ever feel like, you know, you were impersonating an adult or playing a role, hoping others would believe it. You know, I'm guessing, I don't know about you all, but I know what my high school years were like, and I guarantee that was happening. So hope they believe it. I don't, but maybe somebody will. So, you know, you try to pump yourself up and hope other people buy it. But what exactly is that that is so desperate to enhance itself, what is that? You know, if that much effort is required, is it really our true nature? Is it really what we essentially are if we have to make that much effort to justify our existence? Is that, is that, <laughs> are we, are we efforting in the right territory? You know, you know, we can really wonder what that is about, what that drive is um, to sort of um, 
make this life. Um, okay. All right. So the sense of having to uh, protect um, and hopefully enhance the sense of self um, is a cause of insecurity. And I would say, you know, the sense of insecurity and some right outright um, fear or doubt that we feel is totally justified. It's justified because we're trying to um, present ourselves to, to ourselves and to other people as um, as something solid, <laughs> you know, something, an entity there that um, we never can quite pin down. Which sort of brings us to the final layer. And that is um, taking ourselves to be identifying with this body mind, this particular body mind. And it's what we were all taught to do. It's what society believes in. It's the consensus reality that what I am is what lies on this side of my skin. That's what I am. And everything else, all you other folks and the world out there um, is outside that. So we have this, have this deep fundamental dualistic divide. What I take to be me and what we assume to be everything else. So the, this sort of core belief in the fundamental reality the existence of this body mind um, is is at the core of this insecurity, um, because what fear is fundamentally based on is the fear of non-existence, right? You know whether someone says something derogatory about me, or whether you know my job is taken away. Those are all ways that. Um, you know, my sense of myself or, you know, suddenly being um, hacked away at, you know. So it can feel as if uh, our very life itself is being threatened. But then we come down to the body-mind and then it's like, well, you know, that feels real. Right? That feels about as real as it can get. But the body-mind, I mean, we have to acknowledge as an organism is vulnerable, right? It is subject to injury. It is subject to health concerns. You know, it would definitely be subject to the aging process. And ultimately death, right? So what's not to feel insecure about? Right? The body mind is is vulnerable. You know, we do our best to ignore that. You know, we um, you know, one of the common ways we do that is just to stay busy enough that we never think about it. Or when we do think about it, we imagine, oh, that's like way in the future, I'll worry about it then. You know, or we'll come up with some sort of conceptual framework that you know, sort of, sort of works for us as, as best as it can. You know, maybe um, there's a, you know, we have this, you know, quite certain belief in an afterlife and somehow I will get from here to there. I mean, there's this unfortunate interview process in between there, but, you know, I'll deal with that then. But, um, you know, that's, you know, I'll go with that one. Or we can, may think that, well, maybe I didn't, um, I wasn't able to justify my life, you know, through my career or through my family or through um, my service to others. But 
maybe maybe my kids will you know I'll, I'll live on if if not in their memory at least in their dna right that's that that's enough for me i'll, I'll go with that you know so we can come up with these different sort of mindsets about how we can justify um, the certainty of our the ultimate demise of this body mind in these different ways, right? But the one, the one thing that we tend to be reluctant to do is to face that certainty dead on, to really look at it, to really feel into it that this this body, this mind, this memory, the storyline. Um, will have a point of termination. Right? That brings a certain level of reality to it. So the, the question, as far as I see it, is, okay, that is certain. But the question is, is there anything that can be known now, not as a concept or belief, but known directly that is capable or may be capable of surviving death or not subject to death at all. So we can see just by what we've talked about tonight, certainly what other people feel about us, um, you know, our uh, beliefs and ideas and opinions, um, our sense of egoic identity, and even this body-mind, none of those are even candidates, right? All of those will one day end. So I would suggest that the only possible candidate is awareness, right? This sense of beingness that exists in all of us fully already, right this moment, as is that awareness is of a fundamentally different dimension than everything else. Everything else um, we can touch, we can feel, we can think it, we can feel it, um, uh, we can look at it. Uh, it has a form, has a duration. Everything can appear within this field of awareness, and yet this field of awareness is um, untouched by it. You know, very much like a, a mirror, an image, any image can appear in the mirror. You know, the person walks away from the mirror and another person shows up. The mirror reflects that perfectly well and yet is unharmed, untainted by any image. And in a very similar way, that awareness is similar, present, open, receptive to whatever is arising within that field, and yet untainted, unharmed by any of it, right? That awareness is already at peace, right? Because it's not insisting that things be other than they are. It's receptive to whatever, whatever appears in its field It's non-judgmental, ever present, right? Can you ever remember a time or any experience in your life when awareness was absent? Has not every experience that you've ever had in your entire life happened within your awareness?
remember when my um, daughter was born mm, 44 years ago, um, there was, the moment she appeared, um, there was unquestionably awareness present, already present. You know, the, the, the visual field was brand new, but the awareness was already present at birth. So can we say that it wasn't present before birth? We have no proof that it wasn't. You know, if we believe that the awareness is generated by these brain cells, well, yes, then it has a beginning and an end. Um, but that assessment of where the source of awareness is, of being the brain cells, is just speculation, is just a belief, is a concept believed. And one of the con consequences of that concept is that um, awareness ceases to be looked at as anything particularly unusual or special. It's just seen as, well, it's just a function of those brain cells. But I'd suggest that awareness, when we really slow down enough to look at it in its essence, is extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. It is how we view the entire world. It is how we um, notice this body-mind. The only way we notice the body-mind is through our thoughts about it, through our perceptions, looking down at our hands or our feet, and the sensations that are registered in the body, internal or on the skin, right? Thoughts, feelings, perceptions, sensations, that's it. All of those happen within this field of awareness, and that's the entirety of how we experience these body minds. And yet we are desperately holding on to this belief that what is fundamental is this body mind, right? Awareness may be interesting philosophically <laughs> when we think about it, but this is real, right? That's our belief that is the cause of our suffering because this body mind is vulnerable is ultimately vulnerable and recognizing that whether we're doing it consciously or just deep down um, that unease that restlessness that insecurity that anxiety is a totally reasonable response to our situation if we believe that what we are is limited to this body, mind, beliefs, opinions, situation, right? So all of this effort that is trying to <laughs> keep this image of ourself, this idea of ourselves sort of pumped up is just the antidote for this insecurity, right? We, we believe in the fundamental nature of this body-mind as what I am. Um, there's this underlying insecurity because we know that that's vulnerable and there's a sense that it may not be even ultimately true and our way to counter that is to just puff ourselves up by you know, all kinds of things, experiences, wealth, inflated ideas about ourselves. Yeah, you know, different, different, different strategies, right? So we can look at this insecurity as something, you know, sort of annoying or worse, you know, like how do I get rid of it? But I, I would suggest that it is your friend. It is informing you about something vitally important. It's just like, you know, when you stub your toe, there's, it hurts. 
But it's like, you know, your body informing you, hey, <laughs> you just stubbed your toe, you know, watch out for that table or, you know, put some ice on it or do something. You know, so it's a way of informing us that that pain, that, in this case, that underlying sense of, um, I don't know, insecurity, unease, however it may appear in different people under different circumstances. Um, but I'd suggest the source of that is a valid pointer. It's pointing at something um, that is sort of nudging us to look more closely at what is actually living this life, that it's actually awareness living through and as this body-mind. Um, and the body-mind is beautiful, beautiful manifestation. It's just not who we ultimately are. And when that is recognized, when we see the fundamental nature of our innate awareness that's already present, <laughs> already fully developed. It's not like we're becoming more aware. It's just the, the necessity to recognize um, the mysterious one-of-a-kind nature <laughs> of it. You know, it's so common that we don't see it. You know, it's transparent that we miss it. It's not insisting that we notice it or look at it. it doesn't have to, it's reality. You know, it's not gonna go anywhere. It doesn't require our belief in it to exist. It is already what's living your life already fully, right? We just give credit to this uh, imaginary separate self that we believe resides somewhere, maybe up in our head somewhere. That's, that's who we give credit to. But deep down we know that, um, you know, some imposter, <laughs> right? We know that. We may not consciously know that, but that's, that is what this sense of insecurity is nudging us towards looking at, you know, you know, why is this sense of, um, you know, maybe subtle anxiety so commonplace? Um, and it's just that we take ourselves to be something that we're not, you know, no wonder we feel anxious, you know, no wonder we're always trying to um, find ways to feel good about ourselves. Right. But if we can see that whole mechanism clearly and notice that awareness is already fully present, watching us sort of struggle to understand, um, to attain something that will have a, a permanent capacity to elevate us above, well, above the fray, sort of, you know, elevate us to the point where we can relax finally, where there's finally a sense of, ah, I'm finally at home in the world. That would be nice. Mr. Gadada was um, talking about bliss and the the conception in the spiritual world about bliss is that a really, really high state, right? Feeling really, really, really happy. But what he described it as was um, great peace. Great peace. <coughs> right? right? Not, a, not even a high state, just finally peace. But when we can step into that awareness and see what it truly is, seeing, see that everything that ever happens with us, everything that has ever happened, has only happened within awareness. And we might 
even wonder whether that awareness had a birth. Or we'll have a death. Was it ever really born? Or was it present for the birth? You know, again, I'm not suggesting a concept to be believed, just I am pointing to a um, rich territory to investigate. We can wonder, just allow ourselves to um, be fully present for that um, sense of wonder, ah, oh, what is this awareness? You know, it has a mysterious quality to it. We can't actually get a good look at it. It's just present. And perhaps the sheer magnificence of that knowingness will inspire us to look deeper. But we can use this sense of insecurity or restlessness, however we define it or however we feel it for ourselves. We can use that as, uh, yes, it's, this is, um, you could say it's source um, pulling me, uh, nudging me to look deeper to look beyond concepts, to be to look beyond conventional concepts about what what's real, and see what in our own direct experience what what's happening, and what is present for that, and that will lead us to um, what we've always been. We've always been what we seek. It's fine to look everywhere else, you know, to convince, it seems to be needed to convince ourselves that it's not gonna be found out there and what we're left with is what we've always been, what's always been living this life, which is a sense of presence, a sense of awareness, formless, awareness, right? already beyond form, therefore not subject to the comings and goings of form. And when we discover that, we discover that it is already at peace, already at great peace. And it's who we are already, we have always been that.